I was meant to be going on holiday today. That's something a lot of people have said at some point over this past year. Or I was meant to be at a wedding today. Or I was meant to be at a football match, maybe a big European qualifier. Many of us could write a list of places we had planned to be over the past 12 months. But as a result of COVID, they had to be scored out of our diaries and deleted from our calendars. Either the event itself was cancelled or limitations on numbers or travel restrictions meant we were unable to go. Or perhaps it hasn't so much been missed events that have been the biggest frustration for us over the past year, but the inability to be with a friend in their time of need. During the past year, friends have lost loved ones. And in any normal circumstances, we would have gone straight to their house, we would have given them a hug, and we would have been there for them. But for most of 2020 and for all of 2021 so far, that's simply not been an option. For many, there's been the added pain of not being able to spend Christmas with those that they would normally spend it with. And we've felt restricted and limited as never before. In previous years, you could have put pins on a map in various places in Scotland or or the UK or or even the world of places that we had travelled to over the last year. Uh, but, But since March 2020, the pin has barely moved from our home address. We felt the limitation of presence not being able to be where we would have loved to be, not being able to be with those that we would have loved to be with. And we've also felt the lack of the presence of others. Some are quite happy not travelling about all over the place, or they're at a stage in life where that's not really possible. But still, we're used to having the presence of others in our home, or being able to meet up with others for a coffee or for a meal. For some, this past year has been achingly lonely. Grandparents haven't seen their grandchildren. Those in long-distance relationships haven't seen each other. For some of those queuing up for the vaccine, it was the first time they had seen another human being in months. Many of those who died with COVID died alone, with their loved ones not being permitted to be with them and hold their hand in their final hours. But in light of these very painful limitations on our own presence or on others' presence with us, we come this morning to the great truth of God's omnipresence. That is, that God is all present, that he is present everywhere, all of the time. Verse 9 of Psalm 139, which we just read. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall guide me. Boys and girls, God is always with you. God is always with you. There is nowhere that you can go and God won't be there. You might be somewhere far away from your mum and dad. You might grow up and live in a different country, but God will be with you there because God is everywhere. and You can't go anywhere that God isn't. So what we're thinking about today isn't hard to understand, though at the same time it would be easy to get it wrong. When we say that God is everywhere, we don't mean that he's spread out thinly like butter on toast. But all of God is everywhere all of the time. Nor do we mean that God is like a giant with his head above the clouds and his arms in the sky and his feet on the ground. Because in that case, even though a part of the giant is in all those different places, the whole giant isn't everywhere. Whereas all of God is everywhere all of the time. When I was training to be a minister, we went to Colorado for 10 weeks uh, for me to do a placement in the church there. Uh, 
And at one point we went to a place in the middle of absolute nowhere called the Four Corners Monument. It's six hours from the nearest major airport and 33 miles from the nearest town. There's not much to look at. All there is is a little brass brass disc on the ground and yet it attracts thousands of visitors each year. Why? Because that little disc marks the point where four different state boundaries meet. Arizona, Utah, Colorado and New Mexico. And so it's possible to stand there and position yourself so that you are in four different states at the same time. One arm in Arizona, the other in Utah, one leg in Colorado and the other in New Mexico. But that's not what it's like with God because all of God is in Arizona, all of God is in Utah, all of God is in Colorado and all of God is in New Mexico. And it's not that part of God is divided up in each place. And yet at the same time God can't be contained by or limited to state boundaries or or any other boundaries. He doesn't just fill those states. In fact, he doesn't even just fill heaven or earth. 1 Kings 18, 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. Trying to contain God in heaven or earth would be like trying to contain a tsunami in a bucket. Why were God's people in the Old Testament warned so many times not to make images of him, not to make idols? They were strongly tempted to do so. And maybe we don't feel that, that temptation so much, but, but think of them. The nations around them had gods that were visible, but their God was invisible. But why couldn't they just have a, a visible God to worship like all the nations around them? Well, one reason is because gods that are visible, uh, gods that have bodies are limited. They can only be in one place at a time. Uh, Boys and girls, sometimes people try to worship the true God by making an image of him, by making an idol and saying that they weren't worshipping the idol, but they were worshipping God. But God is everywhere all of the time. And an idol can only be in one place at a time. Do you remember the story of how Elijah mocks the worshippers of Baal? Uh, Elijah says to them, maybe he's on a journey. Maybe, Maybe someone comes to your house sometime and you're not there. Why? Because you're away on a journey. You're away seeing someone else. But it's not like that with God. He doesn't need to travel anywhere because he already is everywhere. Or the the Syrians in 1 Kings chapter 20. They think the reason that they've been defeated by Israel Israel is because Israel's gods are gods of the hills. In other words, they thought that the true God was geographically challenged just like their gods. And so the next time they fight Israel in the valleys because they think, well, God's power is only in the hills. But of course they lose again in the valley. Because our God is a God of the the hills and the valleys and everything else. But perhaps at this point you have some questions in your head. Or maybe you'll have questions later on today or during the week as you think through some of the implications of that. And one of the natural questions that might arise is, what about those verses that say God is in heaven? Why does the Lord's Prayer begin, Our Father in Heaven? Why does it say that if He's everywhere? Or why does Psalm 2 verse 4 say that God sits in heaven? And yet it doesn't say that God is only in heaven. It doesn't say that He is limited to heaven. The Lord says in Isaiah 66 verse 1, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Stephen Charnock has a helpful comment where he says that heaven is the court of his majesty, but not the prison of his essence. In other words, we could say that heaven is a place particularly identified with God's rule and glory, but it's not like he's imprisoned there. Heaven is particularly associated with God's presence. That's where God reigns without any opposition. 
There are no rebels against his rule in heaven like there are on earth. Heaven is where the angels are. Heaven is where the souls of just men made perfect are now, as well as the physical body of the Lord Jesus Christ. From heaven God sent his Son and sends his Spirit. Heaven is described, Second Chronicles thirty twenty seven, as his holy dwelling place. There's no sin there to spoil anything. So heaven is the place where God's glory is most clearly seen. But God isn't limited to heaven. But what then about hell? Many think that, well, God rules heaven, but Satan rules hell. Sometimes you hear Christians describing hell as God giving people what they want. That unbelievers who say, in this life I don't want God, will one day experience in hell what it means to exist somewhere that God isn't. So is, is hell a place where, where God is not? Well, at first glance, Second, Corinthians, Second Thessalonians 2.9 seems to support that idea. Where it speaks about those who don't know God and don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And it says they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. But then if we're to turn to Revelation 14.10 it says that unbelievers will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So is that a contradiction? When it says in one place that unbelievers will be punished away from the presence of the Lord and yet it says in another place that they will be punished in the presence of the Lamb. Well clearly the word presence is being used there in two different ways. God isn't present in hell to bless. God isn't present in hell in the same way he's described in Psalm 16 where it says that your presence is fullness of joy. The presence of God in hell is not fullness of joy for those who are there. But God is present in hell to punish If you go to hell, you won't know God's gracious presence. All you will know is his angry presence. And that will be a fearful thing. Mark Jones, who's probably one of the most helpful Christian writers around today, puts it like this. The idea that hell is merely separation from God is misleading and wrong-headed. Rather, it is the opposite. A God-hating sinner who does not have a mediator remains in the presence of a holy, righteous and powerful God. So what is hell? It is for a God-hating sinner who does not have a mediator to remain in the presence of a holy, righteous and powerful God. It is the most fearful thing in the world to die without a mediator. To die without anyone to come between you and an angry God. So let me ask you this morning. Not just do you believe in God. Because the devil believes in God. But do you have a mediator? Do you have someone to stand between you and God. To take the punishment you deserve. For there is one God and one mediator between man and God. The man Christ Jesus and unless you've put your trust in him then your eternal destiny will be in the presence of a holy righteous and powerful God with no one to turn his anger away from you so God is present everywhere his presence isn't limited to heaven and it doesn't exclude hell God being everywhere is a fearful prospect for the unbeliever. But it's one of the most comforting things there is for the believer. Because he's present not just in heaven, but he's present with his people on earth. Even in Stranar, even in lockdown. Particularly, of course, He's present with us by the Spirit. But Father and Son are both omnipresent as well. Yes, the human nature of our Lord Jesus is restricted to heaven. 
But as the eternal Son of God, he is present everywhere, just as he has been from all eternity. And as we've seen before in this series, remember that God's attributes aren't separated from each other. So the God who is all present is also the God who is infinitely good and infinitely wise. You know, sometimes it's, it's helpful to have someone with you in, in a situation, but it's only helpful if, if they actually uh, are able to help you. If they, maybe you're in a tricky situation and you have someone alongside you, but, but if they don't have any more wisdom about the situation than you do, then that's not much help. But the God who is with us is all loving, all wise. He is present with us. He is present with you in order to bless you. He's present with you, not just for the bare fact of being there, but he's present with you in order to bless you. A few weeks ago, we looked at Genesis 26 together. There in verse 3, God says to Isaac, Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and will bless you. I'll be with you and I will bless you. God said to Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 20 I am with you to save you and to deliver you he says to his people in Isaiah 41 10 it's a verse on the children's worksheets fear not for I am with you be not dismayed I am your God I will strengthen you I will help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand in each of those verses God's presence is linked to him blessing saving and strengthening his people so he's not just present with us but he's present with us for a particular purpose so what happens when we forget that God is always with us well we fear fear not for I am with you the two go together if God wasn't with us then we would fear And if we forget that he's with us, then we do fear. If we forget that God is with us, we fear and we also sin. There are many sins that we wouldn't commit in the presence of other people. Many sins are committed in secret, but God is always there. Perhaps we guard our speech in the presence of a child or in the presence of a particularly godly person but we don't do it at other times even though we're always in the presence of God imagine that God's presence has less influence on our actions than the presence of mere humans do you remember the vision of Isaiah in chapter 6 do you remember what he saw in the year that King Uzziah died I, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple well we are always always in the presence of that great God when Jesus which Jesus tells us was a vision of himself when Isaiah's vision faded It's not that God went elsewhere. It's just that Isaiah could no longer see him. But Isaiah was still in the presence of that awesome God. Would we be more diligent at work? Would we redeem the time better at home if someone were watching us? If we knew that our actions were being videoed? If every uh, keyboard click... uh, uh, tap and mouse click were being recorded and yet God is always watching uh, because he is always there and one sin that that we will be prone to commit in particular if we forget about his presence or if we devalue it is the sin of discontent we're familiar with those wonderful words of the Lord Jesus, not recorded in the Gospels, but quoted in the book of Hebrews. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But what's the context in which they're quoted? How does the verse start? Hebrews thirteen five. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. 
We're so often discontent, just waiting for that one more thing that we think that will make us happy. Wishing that our life circumstances would change. And yet how can we be discontent if we have the presence of Christ himself? Be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. How can we be discontent if we have the presence of Christ himself? So those are some of the wrong ways that we'll act if we forget that God is always with us. But positively, how will it help us this week to remember that God is always with us? Well, it will help us when we're tempted. God is closer to us than the devil can ever be. The devil or his demons could stand right beside you this week in order to tempt you. But God is closer to you than that because God is in you. Sometimes when we're tempted, it feels that that God is distant from us, that God is far off, but the devil is right there. The temptation is right there. But actually, God is closer to us than the devil is. God is closer to us than the temptation is. And that's not just true in temptation. There are other times when we feel that God is distant. In fact, the Bible itself talks about God being distant, about God departing. 1 Samuel 16 tells us that the Lord departed from Saul. And after David's sin, what's his great fear? His great fear is that the same thing would happen to him. He prays in Psalm 51, Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. One of the most dramatic scenes in the whole Bible is in Ezekiel chapter 10 when the glory of the Lord leaves the temple. And in all those cases, that departure is due to sin. Isaiah 59 verse 2. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And yet it's not because God is physically distant from us. But a separation has come in because of sin. Which can be dealt with if the sin is dealt with. As Paul told the men of Athens, yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Those men of Athens that he was trying to to see converted, they weren't far from God in terms of distance, but, but what put distance between them and God was their sin. So we could say a person isn't far from God because of, of distance, uh, but because of sin. In the words of St. Augustine, to draw near to him is to become like him. To move away from him is to become unlike him. So it's not about physical locality, it's about being like him or being unlike him. And yet there are other times, aren't there, when we feel far from God. And it's not because of any particular sin. And I think at those times we need to remind ourselves of what's true, even if we can't feel it. We have the promise of the Lord Jesus, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that's true even if you can't feel it. That's true even if God feels a million miles away. Charnock says the devil must prevail so far as to make God cease to be God before he can make him be distant from us. For God to actually be distant from you, believer, he would have to stop being God. And that is never going to happen. Yes, it may seem at times that God is distant from you, but for God actually to be distant from you, he would have to stop being God. How else will it help us in the week ahead to remember that God is always with us? Well, it means that we don't have to be scared. We don't have to fear. Boys and girls, you don't have to be scared when you wake up in the middle of the night because God is always with you. You don't have to be scared about what might happen at school or nursery because God is always with you. And for the bigger people, it means we don't have to be scared either. 
Hebrews 13, after it quotes those words of the Lord Jesus, I will never leave you or forsake you, it immediately goes on, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Nor do we have to fear what unbelievers might get up to, nor do we need to fear what they might do to the church, whether in our lifetime or in our children's lifetimes. Do we fear the new atheists, the advances of humanism and secularism? Well, actually, they are the ones with the most to fear. Psalm 14 talks about the fool who says in his heart there is no God. It talks about them persecuting God's people, about them eating God's people like bread. But what will they one day realize to their great terror? What do they feel even now from time to time underneath all the bravado? Psalm 14 verse 5. There they are in great terror. Why? For God is with the generation of the righteous. Because God is with us, we don't need to fear. But those who pick on and persecute God's people should fear. Beneath it all there is a fear even now. And one day they will truly fear. Picture the scene. One first year pupil is being picked on by a slightly bigger first year pupil. But standing behind the back of the bully is a sixth year pupil who is captain of the local rugby team and just happens to be uh, the, the victim's big brother. And the little brother can see his big brother coming. The bully can't because he's facing the other way. Well, tell me, who should be scared in that scenario? The little brother has nothing to fear because his big brother is there. And he's about to make his angry presence known to the bully. And the bully's confidence begins to waver as he hears the steps coming behind him. He's made a, a terrible miscalculation. And so whatever disconcerting headlines that you may see this week, whatever worrying trends you see and wonder, where's it all going to end up? Well, here's a headline that's even more certain. God is with the generation of the righteous. God is with the generation of the righteous. Of that, you can be certain. Well, there's much more could be said, and tonight I actually want to come back to this topic, particularly to deal with a question that some might have in light of it all, which uh, will undoubtedly take on a, a, a special urgency post-lockdown. And that is the question, well, if God is everywhere, does that mean that someone is no more in his presence in worship than they are when they're mowing the lawn? If God is everywhere, why come to church? Especially if you can now watch sermons being broadcast live. So we'll come back to that tonight and look at more implications of this great teaching of God's omnipresence. But just as we finish this morning, surely we can't look at the topic of God's presence without thinking of how the Lord Jesus was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Jesus, the invisible God became visible. God's presence in the Old Testament was particularly associated with the tabernacle and then the temple. Yes, God was present everywhere, but he chose to make his presence known particularly in those places. In the Old Testament, whenever the people set up their camp, uh, the tabernacle, that is God's tent, was to be in the very middle. If a bird had flown over the top of the camp, it would have been able to look down and see God's tent in the middle and everyone else's tents around it to the north, south, east and west. Uh, maybe you're, you're, you've just read about that recently in Numbers. And that arrangement was picturing something. Even the very arrangement of the tents was picturing the fact that God was graciously choosing to dwell with his people. Yes, God was in all the surrounding countries as well, but he was specially present with his people. There was something special about the Israelite camp, something unique about it compared to anywhere else in the whole world because God... God's tabernacle was at the very center. God was with them in a special way. And then a, a millennium and a half later, Jesus Christ is born. 
And how does the opening chapter of John's Gospel describe his coming? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Literally, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. The presence of God with his people that was pictured in the camp in Israel, it reached its fullest expression in Jesus Christ. And how is heaven described in the Bible? It's to be with Christ. And how are are the new heavens and the new earth described? Well, they're described as God dwelling with his people. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. All the barriers to us dwelling with God that we experience here and now will be gone. All our sin dealt with once and for all. And what was pictured all those thousands of years ago in the camp of Israel will be fully and finally realised. Amen. Well, let's praise the God in whose presence we always are with the words of Psalm 139. Psalm 139. We'll sing the first four verses, noticing particularly as we sing it, verse verse 4. Where can I from your spirit be? Where from your presence can I flee? You are in heaven if there I fly, and in the grave if there I lie. And although we're not singing it, verse 5 goes on to say, If I the wings of morning take, the seas far side my dwelling make, even there your hand will, my guide will be, your right hand will take hold of me. What a, a comforting truth it is to know that wherever we go, God is always with us. Psalm 139, 1-4, let's sing praise.